In this program, the topic will be one of the main causes of death in the Western world, cancer. We will delve deep into the heart of cells to discover what role genes play in the growth of cancer. We will then recap traditional therapeutic treatment, and we will close on some very promising new ones. In spite of all the research conducted in recent years, in spite of the new treatments tried since the 50s, the cancer rate continues to rise. Even if cancers of the skin, testes, breast, uterus, and bladder have now been pretty well brought under control, intestine, stomach, and lung cancer are as devastating as ever. It was recently discovered that each of our body cells possess genes which under certain conditions can transform a normal cell into a cancer cell. This finding was so important that it earned its discoverers Harold Varmus and Michael Bishop a Nobel Prize for Medicine. Our body is like a huge city inhabited by billions of individuals, cells. Most of the time, in spite of its complexity, the human organism keeps itself in a state of stability that would make a human society green with envy. However, to maintain that balance, each cell of our body is subjected to rigorous discipline. First, cells all have a specific duty to perform. For example, the nervous system cells transmit information between the various parts of the body, whereas the digestive tract cells ensure the digestion of foods. Furthermore, every cell must divide at a regular pre-established rate. Cellular division plays several roles. In children, it permits growth. In adults, it ensures the renewal of living tissue. Sometimes, however, a cell may break the rules of the body's organization. The rebel cell, which can belong to any organ, ceases to perform the task assigned to it. Moreover, it begins to divide in a completely uncontrolled way. In a few months or a few years, its descendants, which tend to stick to each other, will form an abnormal mass. That mass is a cancerous tumor. It's by growing that cancer threatens the organism's life. It drains the nutritive elements normally intended for the healthy cells. Then it replaces them one by one. It therefore turns the organ into a mass of cells no longer capable of functioning. For years, scientists have been trying to understand how and why normal cells turn into cancer cells. They now have part of the answer. Microscopic entities, cancer genes, huddled within the hearts of cells, may ultimately be responsible for cancer. There are hundreds of thousands of genes in a human cell. They control all cellular activity, such as the production of useful substances or cell reproduction. Genes are like small electric switches. They can be turned on or off. However, most genes are only turned on for a short period in a person's life and then put to sleep. Therefore, at any given moment, only a small number of a cell's genes are functioning. It sometimes happens, though, that some of the cell's dormant genes are reactivated. Their sudden awakening disrupts the activities of the cell. The cell becomes incapable of performing the tasks assigned to it and starts dividing chaotically. It has turned into a cancer cell. Scientists now have much evidence proving that these genes, called cancer genes or oncogenes, are responsible for cancer formation. By studying various tumors, they have noted that their cells still contained activated cancer genes. If cancer genes are introduced to a colony of healthy cells, the latter all develop the characteristics of cancer cells.
Recently, researchers succeeded in transplanting cancer genes from a human breast into the fertilized ovum of a mouse. Breast cancer is common among the descendants of the mouse lineage produced. Approximately 50 cancer genes have been discovered. Scientists have proven that everyone has them, and not only people who develop cancer, but they continue to try and understand why cancer genes become active in some people and not in others. At present, a number of researchers suspect the environment of being the main cause of cancer. Various environmental agents like heavy metals, chemical products, and even viruses cause changes in cell chromosomes. These changes would make one or several of the cancer genes wake up and thus trigger the cancer process. We are all probably exposed to several of these cancer agents every day. Perhaps cancer cells form continuously in our organism. But our immune system apparently eliminates them as they appear. Scientists still ignore the reasons that cause these cells to sometimes evade our body's defense mechanisms and form cancers. Hereditary factors, general physical condition, diet, and stress may supply clues. Cancer remains much of an enigma. However, thanks to strides in basic research, the mysteries surrounding it are gradually evaporating. Half of all cancers are related in one way or another to our lifestyle. But generally speaking, identifying carcinogenic substances is a very complex process. Around the 60s, a sort of collective fear set in. A number of products were declared dangerous and withdrawn from the market. The same happened more recently with atmospheric pollutants. However, it is highly unlikely that the thousands of potentially cancer-producing substances used today will ever be completely eliminated. In the fight against cancer, prevention is essential, as is early detection. Still today, the first lines of defense against cancer are chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation therapy. Learning one has cancer during a regular medical checkup can be devastating. But nowadays, it is far from being a death sentence. In the past 20 years, a whole arsenal of anti-cancer treatments has been developed. Thanks to them, many battles with cancer have been won. The choice of treatment depends on how advanced the cancer is and how fast it spreads. Localized cancers can often be cured by surgical removal. When surgeons remove a tumor, they must take a number of precautions. They must at all costs avoid the dispersal of the tumor cells in the patient's body. One single cancer cell accidentally detached from the tumor can proliferate in no time and generate a new cancer site. To make sure that all the cancerous tissues have been removed, surgeons will also cut away a layer of healthy tissues around the tumor. A new technique, hormone therapy, can greatly facilitate surgery of some tumors, as in the case of prostate cancer. Hormone therapy consists of giving the patient synthetic hormones that counteract male sexual hormones for three months preceding the operation and three months following the operation. Male sexual hormones foster the growth and spreading of prostate cancer. The synthetic hormones thus greatly reduce the volume of the prostate and hence the cancer. tumor is then easier to remove. Loss of blood during the operation and the risk of affecting the patient's sexual functions are therefore minimized. 
Regular injections of the hormone for six months after the operation reduce the chances of the cancer returning or spreading. When a cancer extends beyond its original site and spreads over an entire region of the body, surgery is no longer possible. Radiation therapy is the next step. Radiation therapy is based on the sensitivity of living cells to rays beamed by radioactive bodies such as cobalt-60. The radiation penetrates the cells and sections the genetic deoxyribonucleic acid molecules, or DNA. The genes, which normally rule all cell activity, become inoperative. The X-rayed cells lose their capacity to divide and die. Unlike the surgeon's hands, which only remove the tumor, radiation therapy affects healthy cells as well as cancer cells. Fortunately, healthy cells have the capacity to repair the damage caused by X-ray beams better than cancer cells. After being exposed to a beam of cobalt-60, healthy tissues will reform, whereas the cancer tissues may have been destroyed. While radiation therapy does not always destroy a cancer, it at least restrains the malignancy and attenuates its symptoms. However, radiation therapy proves ineffective when the cancer has metastasized to several regions of the body. Metastases are secondary cancers that originate from the main cancer site. They are formed by cancer cells that have separated naturally from the original tumor. These cells are spread through the blood or lymphatic system, network of vessels throughout the body. These vessels are lined with lymph glands or nodes which filter out the cancer cells. Most of these cells die, but sooner or later, one of them will survive, causing a new cancer to develop. When a cancer has spread into metastases, the latter can continue to grow reaching the stage of generalized cancer. Then chemotherapy is the last resort. This treatment is based on administering drugs that kill or restrain cancer cells. At present, some 40 anti-cancer drugs exist. Whether of synthetic or natural origin, these drugs have a common characteristic. They primarily attack rapidly dividing cells, such as cancer cells, and spare most of the body's healthy cells, which divide at a slower rate. An anti-cancer drug must be able to kill the billion cancer cells in a tumor of one gram, while killing as few normal cells as possible. However, chemotherapy can destroy healthy cells in active division, such as bone marrow cells, the cells of the intestinal walls, and the roots of hair. The destruction of these cells explains the nausea, hair loss, and other side effects of chemotherapy. In spite of their limitations, surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy have been shown to be effective. For the best chances of a cure, these treatments are often combined. On the whole, these therapies do help cure many cancers. When it comes to beating cancer, anything goes. Alternative medicine suggests dietary cures, whereas traditional medicine tries to find new treatments. For example, scientists noticed that cancer patients with a high fever went into remission. They then realized that heat itself is therapeutic. Not only does it destroy cancer cells, but when combined with other therapies, it enhances their effectiveness tenfold. It can thus cause a tumor to regress and be used as treatment prior to surgery. At present, the treatment of cancer is moving in a variety of directions, some quite amazing. In spite of the progress achieved over the past 20 years in the fight against cancer, some forms of cancer still resist treatment. In efforts to combat these tenacious foes, Scientists are developing new weapons, some of which show promise. 
One of these new techniques is already being used in hospitals with some success. The treatment, photochemotherapy, combines the beneficial effects of chemotherapy and radiation therapy without causing their respective side effects. Photochemotherapy is based on the use of a natural chemical compound of the human body, porphyrin. Small amounts of this compound, close to blood hemoglobin, is produced normally by all body cells. Researchers have discovered, however, that cancer cells, when applied with a chemical substance called aminolevulinic acid, produce far greater quantities of porphyrin than healthy cells. And porphyrin also has the property of becoming toxic in the presence of light. These two properties have led to a highly effective treatment for several types of cancer, such as skin cancer. The doctor first applies aminolevulinic acid to the tumor. The tumor begins producing large amounts of porphyrin. The doctor then beams a ray of red light on the tumor. Easily absorbed by human tissues, the red light activates the porphyrin molecules, which then initiate a series of chemical reactions that will destroy the tumor. Photochemotherapy has many advantages. Since porphyrin is mostly produced by cancer cells, there is little risk of the treatment damaging the body's healthy cells. The use of a light beam also provides greater control of the drug. Furthermore, the body eliminates porphyrin within a few hours. The development of new treatments is not our only hope of winning the war against cancer. Early detection greatly enhances the life expectancy of cancer victims. Still today, Cancer is often detected too late to be cured. Chemical substances called monoclonal antibodies may considerably improve the detection of cancer. The use of these substances is based on the presence of molecules called antigenes on the surface of all body cells. Antigenes are like minute labels. Their shape varies according to the type of cells they belong to. Monoclonal antibodies developed against cancer cells have the ability to recognize the antigenes of the cells and to bind to them. Monoclonal antibodies are made by amalgamating antigen-carrying cancer cells to a particular type of white corpuscle. The resulting hybrid cell begins to produce monoclonal antibodies, thus called because they come from the same clone of a cell. These antibodies can, among other things, distinguish cancer cells from healthy cells. And they attach themselves to cancer cells like a key in its lock. The hybrid cell clone can be produced at will, ensuring an unlimited supply of monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies can be used to make sure that the surgeon has removed a breast tumor completely. For several years now, in the majority of breast cancer cases, the breast is no longer removed entirely. The tumor alone is removed, together with a layer of healthy tissues, as a safety margin. Cancer cells may remain in the breast accidentally and start proliferating again. A new technique performed during the operation will solve this problem. The technique consists of applying monoclonal antibodies combined with molecules of a colored substance to the healthy tissues just removed. If there are still cancer cells in the healthy tissues, the antibodies will reveal them by producing a brown color. The surgeon can then determine whether more radical surgery is required. Researchers are also developing monoclonal antibodies that will detect breast cancer through a simple blood test. They are even working on magic bullet drugs. 
These drugs, which consist of monoclonal antibodies united to anti-cancer drugs, will kill cancer cells without affecting the healthy cells in the body. Just as knowledge has its causes and its mechanisms, cancer treatment techniques are progressing by leaps and bounds. Within a few decades, perhaps cancer will be nothing more than a bad memory. Some cancer therapies have side effects that are next to unbearable, causing terrible physical pain. Should doctors continue using them, even when the chances of a cure are extremely slight?